Today I have with me Adrian, founder of the only Bitcoin fund registered both in Singapore and in Dubai. Adrian shares his experience with regulators and bankers, especially after the recent crisis, his strategy on investing in Bitcoin, and why he believes that serious investors should invest via Bitcoin fund. Hi Adrian, it's good to have a friend and a fellow Viper on 21 Towers. Uh, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks, thanks, Sunny, for having me. So, you can tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into Bitcoin. Sure. So, uh, you know, I started my career in as an investment banker in mergers and acquisitions, and then um, I ended up being tech CEO, and I ran a, a Web two company, as we now uh, call about it. And when we had a, a merger and an exit in two thousand fourteen. I started Fintonio Group in 2014, as well as a couple of fintech companies. And as a fintech venture capital firm, which is how Fintonio Group started, we invested in fintech companies. And that's where we came across Bitcoin in 2014, actually, because uh, back then these were called fintech companies. And we saw a bunch of uh, <clears throat> Bitcoin companies looking to remit money to the Philippines using Bitcoin and we also came across a well-known exchange called BitMEX, uh, BitX, uh, etc. Unfortunately for for us as a fund, we never invested in any of these companies because we thought it was quite niche back then. I guess fast forward to today, obviously the ecosystem, um, Bitcoin and the broader um, digital assets ecosystem has grown tremendously. The best thing out of this experience was as part of my due diligence of trying to send Bitcoin to the Philippines, I bought some. And I, it was very difficult. And the best thing about it was I forgot I had it. So buy and hold Bitcoin has done very well over the years. Uh, sadly for me, I didn't really buy that much. So um, even though it was up a lot and I rediscovered it, it's not as much as I should have bought. But ha having understood that Bitcoin now is uh, really uh, important, having been in fintech and seeing how broken our financial services system is, I see great opportunity for Bitcoin, as well as in the future, some other kind of smart contract based financial services. So this is great. First of all, everybody, the regret of not having enough is 100% common with everybody, even hardcore Bitcoiners, you always wish that you'd bought more in the past, right? It's a, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the upside that has happened over the last few years. But it's really interesting. You have a background in FinTech and you said that having seen how the kind of the financial system or the fintech companies or traditional fintech companies compared to Bitcoin, at least are traditional are broken. You saw an opportunity over here because that's been your background, right? That, that's really interesting. Yes. So I think public blockchains versus private blockchains, we're going to have discussion, but essentially we started a digital lending business. We had an alternative data credit scoring business to try and reduce the cost of risk, trying to use alternative data to improve financial inclusion, right? And what I discovered through all the various fintech companies is, you know, banks and to some extent regulators are using technology from the 1960s before I was born. So things that we take for granted today, which is instantaneous. If we book a Grab, we book an Uber, it's instantaneous. We see a response immediately. Why can't financial services be instantaneous? If I transfer you $100, why doesn't it appear on your account, on your ledger? And the reality is some banks are still using IBM mainframes from 1960s, and that's why. And But when you have a public blockchain and you can see transfers and a ledger happen, it opens up a whole new world. Certain intermediary costs will go, and if the costs go, then the financial services become more available for people. I mean, that's that's the benefit of technology. I, I saw that in jobs when I ran Jobs DB. Uh, I see this in financial services. The problem in financial services is regulations and uh, incumbent institutions and the fact that our monetary system in some ways has become weaponized. If you talk about US dollars and now in the world where there's more multipolar world, there's no kind of central money. And this is one potential opportunity for Bitcoin. There's so many topics you've mentioned to uncover and hopefully we get time to uncover some of them. And of course, I want to talk about the Bitcoin products um, that you offer through Fintonia. But do you, so you, you mentioned a couple of things. Are you specifically talking about Bitcoin because you also mentioned about public blockchains? So do you think Bitcoin different from other 
uh, cryptocurrencies or are you talking about public blockchains in general? Well, I, I should say, and I say this to everybody, I saying everyone should understand there's Bitcoin and then there's the rest. Bitcoin is the closest thing to uh, a store of value or a monetary good. And the easiest thing to understand for people is gold. When I was an investment banker, I bought, I helped buy and sell resource companies in Australia, including gold companies. And then to value a gold company, you produce a whole bunch of gold. And then you'd say, what cash do you get from the gold? Nothing. Gold doesn't give you any cash, but there's a forecasted price based on historical use of gold. And, you know, we can do, we can say, oh, well, gold has been around for a long time. So I can do these uh, charts and uh, correlations and models, but essentially it's because gold to store a value when there's war, people buy gold, I store it in my bed. And so Bitcoin's just a digital form and a better form for the new age, which is the internet age. And uh, no one controls Bitcoin. So that's why I say Bitcoin is the closest thing to money or a store of value. I think the other cryptocurrencies I say are technology bets is how I think about it. You know, these are public blockchains. Store of value is a concept of acceptance and adoption. If you and I think gold is worth something, then it becomes worth something. And we store our value in it. And it's the same with Bitcoin. As more and more people accept that it's worth something and you can't, you have security, uh, the Chinese government can't control it, the US government can't control it, then then it actually becomes valuable. And, and therefore, if there's only 21 million and it's programmed, then we see longer term, it's like buying land in Singapore. It's generational. It's going to go up because it's scarce. And it can't be surpassed by technology because store of value is acceptance. And acceptance is a one thing, right? It's a network effect thing. Everyone thinks it's worth value and it's not controlled. If I control, create a coin today, which it transacts faster, but I control it, well, no one's going to trust it because, you know, I control it. So I think that's why I, I always say Bitcoin's a certain thing. And then you have these other smart contracts, whether it's private, you know, public blockchains or whether it's private that help execute things. So like I ran a fintech company, I have my own private code and I have a loan management system or whatever. I, I, I write business rules, right? Now we have a public blockchain that can help you write business rules. But is it money? No, it's more like a technology bet. You know, it's like I'm buying a fitness first gym membership, right? And I'm just kind of people need to use my gym membership to use the equipment to do classes. And then they'll maybe create more classes and do more stuff. But if I'm trying to sell my fitness first membership on the secondary market, well, it's like having a bet that Fitness First Gym is going to be better than Virgin Active Gym or, or something. Whereas in Bitcoin, it's different, right? Bitcoin is your store of value, right? And as a firm, we try and make Bitcoin clear what that value proposition is. And our other funds that deal with other crypto are more like uh, active trader kind of things. Two different things, yeah, in my mind. Yeah, I absolutely agree with the difference that I think you've set it out perfectly and you know just saying that bitcoin is a store of value and everything else in the cryptocurrency world is a technology bed or a technology company and i personally believe that the store of value market size is huge and underestimated by most people they're like oh it's a store of value and they think because it's just a store of value and not a technology company that the market size is really really small but actually it is all of money in the world so it is the biggest kind of opportunity out there and i think when you grow up in financial services like i have or i started my career you take a lot of things for granted but you know when i got into fintech and i and i realized how many things are broken you know we sign documents that are basically disclaimers of 100 pages that no one reads right but from a regulator perspective they're feeling it's happy the banks and so you end up in some world where the cost to income ratio for a bank is 60 70 percent and a lot of people don't have access to these financial services and then you have some DeFi protocols it's called a smart contract based financial services and the cost income ratio is like 10 percent or less so somewhere in between there there's an opportunity where we can remake financial services and financial services needs a backbone and today it's the us dollar is the global reserve currency two challenges with that <laughs> one is i guess the us dollar has in, by some countries has been seen to be weaponized i.e russia you know and then china doesn't feel comfortable and then on the other side is you're stuck with the us monetary policy for better or for worse print a lot of money things like that so if you're going to have smart contract based financial services which is going to be more efficient than people branches all these things and you need to have some unit of account and 
this is where Bitcoin may be. Uh, can I use Polygon? Can I use Ethereum? Yeah, I can use all of those things, but in the back of my mind, at least, somebody controls it. But how this evolves, we don't know, but it's, it's exciting to be right in the middle of it. Absolutely. And do you have any strategies or kind of risk management or you know, principles that you recommend to people who are newly getting involved in Bitcoin or want to make Bitcoin a part of their portfolio? Yes. I mean, so for sure, I, I always believe Bitcoin should be part of your portfolio. And, and in general, as an investor, you should always understand why you're investing. And the thesis for Bitcoin is, is, like a, is digital gold. As it increases adoption, the value is going to go up tremendously because it's 21 million, right? And then you, there's a lot more detail. But broadly speaking, just say so you make it 5% of your portfolio, right? For us in investments, we always talk about asymmetric return. So Bitcoin today is roughly 450 billion market cap, say 30, 40 billion of daily liquidity. We talk about asymmetric return. If I put 5% of my portfolio in it, the worst case, not that I think this will happen, the worst case, it goes to zero. But there is a potential for this 5% to become 50, 60% of my portfolio. So an asymmetric kind of bet. We always look for that where the risk and downside is known. So that's the why Bitcoin. Then the question is, how Bitcoin, right? And obviously, from the most pure perspective, you would go and buy a cold storage wallet and buy and, and keep your own Bitcoin. For many people, that's difficult. Then I would say work with a licensed and trusted partner. So for, for Fintonia Group, we are licensed here in Singapore with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is a very strict world-class regulator, as well as we have a license in Dubai. And why is that important? That means a lot of the things that have happened last year in the crypto world didn't happen to us. We had no impact by FTX, Genesis, BlockFi, this year, Silvergate and Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank. And part of that is to get a license, you need certain experience and qualifications. To maintain a license, uh, you have to have certain processes and procedures, enterprise-wide risk management, counterparty risk limits, third-party license custody. There's a whole bunch of things that we, we need to do and we're audited and regularly checked. And that just gives investors comfort. You can kind of take comfort that there are at least some minimum standards. Now, obviously, in the world, licensed entities can also be fraudulent. Licensed entities can also go under, but it's probably a thousand or 10,000 times less likely. So if we look at last year, all of the companies within the crypto world that went under, I can even think here in Babel Finance, Hodlnort, just here in Singapore, Talk, uh, multiple ones, they were all unlicensed. And what's come out is they probably did things they shouldn't have with their clients' uh, funds and assets. Is it getting more difficult to get these licenses uh, after the incidents, events that have happened over the last few months? Uh, absolutely. I think in Singapore, they have one particular license called the Payment Services Act, uh, DPT, Digital Payments Token License. I think they've had 18, they've had about 300 applications. They've approved 18 in principle, of which six have only got the full license. So another 12 are waiting. And I don't think there's been any, and the average wait time, I think, is now up to 2.8 years. I don't think it's moving anytime soon because I, I, you and you've got one of the licenses among the ones that have been fully approved yeah so we have what's called a capital market service license which is for funds management and uh and so we're a we're a licensed asset and wealth manager focusing on disruptive technology and which is essentially for us digital assets and and crypto and then we have a, a license we're one of the first batch within in dubai by the virtual assets regulatory authority we also got in that first batch was uh, uh, was FTX, but also Binance, Crypto.com. So they invited us as a, I guess, a, a, a tier one licensed institution to uh, to open up in Dubai. I guess you really got lucky that your regulatory or all your licenses and everything that part of the process got done happened before all of these events, right? It's this great timing because I think you got all of these last year. I think the Singapore license you just got recently, right? No, we actually, we got our license in 2016, but we were upgraded in 2020, yeah, last year, December. Yeah. So, um, and then we also got the Dubai license. So what's been good for us is we've been building what we hope is a sustainable business, a sustainable business practices, and that's held us in good stead. Because uh, there were many things that we couldn't do or wouldn't do, but now, you know, we're in, uh, we're in pretty good shape. And I want to talk about it, of course, I want to go in detail with the products and services. Just one more question before that. 
how's the how's the experience with banking relationships in for the fund in singapore again uh, as a result of these events you know it is difficult i think banking channels have always been difficult silvergate and signature bank by far uh, had the biggest us dollar kind of fiat ramps we were clients of these banks we didn't lose anything we withdrew i think as part of uh, our risk management is uh, we have alternatives so we were able to withdraw many of our friends and peers didn't have other bank accounts to withdraw too <laughs> so they were stuck was in we did, we do have plan b plan c etc uh, so we were able to withdraw all our funds in time but it is difficult so as a licensed entity we have i would say slightly less friction because they know that we have certain standards we have a license anti money laundering kyc uh, kyt tracing the blockchain uh, things like that but it's still difficult because from a bank's perspective it's not so much from their perspective they say big risk i can lose my us clearing license how much money can i make uh, i don't care if you finance your risk is too high so for example binance which is uh, very large has basically been disconnected from the US banking system. Doesn't matter how much money they can pay you, the banks don't want it, right? So, we've seen that we we still have different banking channels. What I imagine will happen is there would be trading in currencies other than US dollars because the US seems to be quite difficult now in terms of risk appetite. You know, I imagine that there will be euro, sing dollar, sing dollar just because I'm in Singapore, but some other alternative currency for ramps. into uh into the ecosystem sad reality that even as a licensed entity you would say that there is only slightly less friction for banking relationships but yeah i know this is the way it is it's a reality and it's becoming worse over the last few months so what what we find is and because we're licensed we the onboarding takes a long time so we we basically have a team that's always onboarding but the good thing is once we're done money flows for our investors straight in a straightforward way because if you redeem from our funds if you redeem from binance for sure you're going to get blocked or some exchange right you're going to be high risk there's going to be a question uh, show us your documents oh you do crypto uh, and you could just be stuck in limbo your money can be stuck but we haven't had any of our clients have any problem we the redeem we just uh, people redeem from our fund even recently we just deposited a large amount in the in the big in the millions no problems because it's come from a licensed fund manager right so that is very different if it comes from Uh, unregulated exchange or even if the exchange is regulated is considered high risk so all transactions uh, un- under fatf and all transactions for a virtual asset service provider above 3000 sing us dollars or 3000 euro is flagged on the on uh, under the fatf guideline which i think is now coming to force uh, this year it's crazy ah uh, well let's talk about the funds the actual products that you offer uh, in the digital asset bitcoin space Uh, so tell us a little bit about. I think you have two products, right? The Fintonia Bitcoin Physical Fund and the Fintonia Corporate Treasury. So I'm just going to put yeah. up these uh, the website as well while you talk about it. Sure. So look, if we if we, if we understand why Bitcoin, and the question is, what's a safe way to get exposure to Bitcoin, right? Uh, some people will buy it physically. um but for many others at scale it's a uh, it's difficult to do so we we created an institutional grade um fund managed by a licensed fund manager which basically tracks the price of bitcoin so buying and selling or executing uh we do better because i guess there's a 1000 exchanges and the price can differ up to 5 uh, percent at any one time so obviously we connect to multiple exchanges and market makers and have for smart ordering and order management systems many exchanges actually trade against their clients which has come out with FTX come out with Binance and so the only way you can really get best execution is to be go to multiple venues so our tracker fund executes better i think we also use third party qualified uh, licensed custodians who are insured so they hold the bitcoin in cold storage so they are put in the, the the you know and we select these custodians to make sure that they are uh, institutional grade and then finally for some people in some countries passing on your bitcoin to your estate can be difficult first of all you have to work out can you off ramp it with the exchange layer you sell it and then when you sell it to the bank they will often say where did you get this and you say i got my bitcoin from my grandfather and say okay well prove to me your grandfather is not a criminal show his source of wealth his source of funds show that he bought the bitcoin appropriately it's a lot of friction because we're not yet fully adopted in the current financial system so a redemption from a fund also just removes that because a fund 
is a legal entity. It's well, uh, well, it's a, it's a legal concept that people can say, okay, I can put in my will, I can put in my estate. So for some investors, institutional investors, and also anyone with we call fiduciary duties to clients, they will never uh, suggest their clients go to a self-directed trade on an unlicensed exchange. So this product we, we, we created allows people to have a safe and uh, secure, efficient exposure to Bitcoin. And that's the Fintonia Bitcoin Physical Fund, right? Yes, that's right. Um, so just a little bit for a few more details on the Bitcoin Physical Fund. What's the minimum investment size? So the minimum investment size for an individual is 350,000 US. If we if we take, and that's a regulatory requirement from um, the master fund, which is in Jersey, United Kingdom, so it's 250,000 pounds. But we also do smaller amounts if we are managing the whole, the, the client's portfolio in a, um, in a discretionary manner. So what we found was there are some clients that say, you know what, I want to dollar cost average because I can't take the volatility. I just feel safer, right? I, I, I don't want to put one, one, one amount. So what we've done, because some clients have, and, and say, can you do that for us? So we have a second fund, which is essentially uh, the enhanced yield fund, which is a fund which invests in US treasuries, basically. Short-term US treasuries, getting around seven to 9%. So minimum 70% in US treasuries. And the remaining 10 to 30%, uh, our trading team does some macro trades across the yield curve. So it's an actively traded US treasury fund. So that's why we can get a higher return whilst keeping the risk relatively manageable. And so- And that's the Fintonia corporate treasury product. Uh, it's the enhanced the yield, not on this page, but- Okay. Um, but Fair the enough. enhanced yield fund, what's interesting for the enhanced yield fund is obviously we have traditional investors who just have <clears throat> US dollars or they want to put to work, but we can also take stable coin because we have some crypto native clients. But what's interesting for these two funds is back to your question, the minimum is for the clients that want to dollar cost average, they give us a, a pool of money and, a, and essentially we put it in their hands, yield fund, so it's, so it's earning something, say seven to 9%. And then uh, we basically dollar cost average or we have certain buy signals where we, we buy. Now, if we think Bitcoin's a structurally upward asset, there's an argument of whether or not you, you should dollar cost average or you should buy in one at, all at one go. We definitely have clients that just feel better to put it in the enhanced yield fund and then we dollar cost average over, over time. What do you recommend if you have to say from a stati from data point of view, uh, is it better to dollar cost average into Bitcoin or to buy all at once? Because this is a question I get all the time and I have two different answers. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one is I an mean, emotional answer risk, and one is a yeah. mathematical answer. <laughs> yeah, I think mathematically it, it will be shown that, look, a structurally upward asset, if you believe it's just adoption and it's going to continue to go upwards, then it's just better earlier and as much as you can. But there are many, many people who, who and investors, so financial advisors that just cannot take that volatility. So that's why we say it's 350,000 minimum, but if people give it to us to manage, then we can dollar cost average smaller amounts over a period of time. So, um, and that's a regulatory thing as well, because we are a licensed fund manager, we can have a discretionary portfolio. So we have clients that could easily, they, they actually put in more than the 350,000, but they just don't want to do it all at once. Yeah, right? so emotionally, wanna, exactly. emotionally made sense to dollar cost average. And that's what I now recommend everyone, just dollar cost average because it's an emotional decision, which it is, everything in life yeah. is. <laughs> We, yeah, so we, have, we have a family office that, that can put a, a few million. Uh, a, so so, so they're, they're, they're quite good in the sense they go, hey, we have a few million as part of our portfolio allocation, right? As a hedge against the financial system and the US dollar and all these things. So we believe it. But the managers like, hey, but our principal, you know, uh, the, the, the principal and the, and the investment guy is like, we can't take this volatility. So they give it to us and we put in their hands yield fund and then we essentially dollar cost average around 80% of it. And then 20%, we kind of like time. There's certain technical figures. You go, okay, now's a, now, now we think we can put a bit more. But essentially, it's a dollar cost average strategy. So they can for sure do the minimum, but they say, hey, no, no, we want to do that. But for them, it's and a the, generation. Effect. And the yield percentage is pretty high. Is there, How do you generate the yield? I mean, you well, said you put it in US treasuries, but you're offering a lot more uh, than the yeah. US treasury rate. 
So, so essentially, it's it's an actively traded U.S. Treasury fund. So we have say seventy percent U.S. Treasuries, you know, short-term U.S. Treasuries between four point six, four point eight. I think three-year, uh, two-year Treasury now at four, three point nine. I have to, I have to check. And we have a trade. We have a very experienced trading um, and investments team. So that remaining ten to thirty percent of uh, that we don't put in U.S. Treasuries, we basically do interest rate swaps. Uh, we trade across the yield curve because our team has this long history in FX and emerging markets, FX and FX options, which are very similar to, to cryptocurrencies, to be honest, <laughs> particularly emerging markets where there's you know, just counterparty risk, there's you know all, all sorts of information asymmetry and, and so on. So they're very ex ma experienced macro traders. So essentially, you can take a position on the yield curve. So you do dynamic trading across the yield curve because at the moment, we're in this inverted yield curve where short-term interest rates are higher than the long-term. Usually it's the other way around. And most fixed income funds are buy and hold, but we that 10% to 30%, we can trade. So okay. yeah, essentially it's, uh, you, you think about it, you're basically borrowing long because it's cheap and then you are selling short. And then there's other, there's other, you know, and you can make it duration neutral. You can make it interest rate neutral. So, so that's the team. And but these are all U.S. Treasury futures, U.S. Treasury interest rate swaps. So it's still right. kind of U.S. Treasuries. Got it. So at least the capital is safe, even though you might end up making maybe some losses at on some trades. But the capital remains, the principal remains safe because it's all U.S. Treasury. Yes. Where are the funds are domiciled? So we are Singapore. We call it Singapore. BCC, which is essentially a Singapore umbrella entity with the sub funds underneath. But the Bitcoin fund uh, has this Singapore umbrella, but it, uh, it invests into a master fund in Jersey, United Kingdom. And that's for tax purposes, of course. Uh, could you, uh, and can, can you tell us what the, what the fund fee is in, in the different funds that you have? Sure. So in the, in the Bitcoin fund, uh, at the moment, it's a two and a half percent per annum that um, being able to uh, our execution more than offsetting. So we track the Bitcoin index price. So we uh, track the index price very well uh, after fees. And the index price is the Singapore Stock Exchange BTC index price. And, and, and they license that. And that's essentially 11 exchanges around the world, weighted average pricing, and they have a methodology. So we track that very well. I think it's very difficult for an individual to try and do that. So even after fees, we, we track that very well. But essentially, for larger amounts, then we, we reduce the fees. Okay, all right. And what's uh, are you comfortable to share how the fund has performed? Because I'm sure the interest in the fund goes up and down with Bitcoin's price. So how's it been? Uh, any, yeah. any data that you can share in terms of AUM or Sure. So the, the AOM is in the double digit millions. Uh, it's obviously, we got all the regulatory approval and got all the things done in November 2021 when <laughs> Bitcoin price was 60. So our fund a AUM, just because we track Bitcoin, that's what we're supposed to do, is down obviously a lot. This year we're up 80, whatever, 87%, just like the Bitcoin price. So we're very, we're essentially tracking the Bitcoin price. So hopefully, uh, you know, if the AUM was to, uh, if the Bitcoin price continues to go up, what's interesting is the psychology of uh, investors and, uh, and our investment partners, because Bitcoin has gone up now, people are now thinking, oh, okay, now we really need to think to buy. Reality was, you know, some of the best times to buy were last year. Totally. Yeah. But uh, has the interest increased? Like, I mean, it's crossed the psychological barrier of $30,000. We are recording this on 14th April, I think day before yesterday. Have you yeah. started getting those calls that, hey, you were talking about Bitcoin and I should have, you know, tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, there's has definitely, it started already? Yeah, there's definitely interest. And also from, let's call it, you know, the asset, other asset managers, other wealth managers, because there's no other licensed product in the region, right? And in fact, and that's what I'm gonna, gonna next. I wanted to ask you, like, do you you compete with Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, or mm -hmm. any other such products in out of Dubai, out of US, out of Canada? No, not not well. I guess theoretically, yes, but usually, and it's around the world, most investment products are localized because people are comfortable with the regulatory regime, the tax, the and the fact that the investors are here. So Grayscale is a is obviously a, a the, the, the issue with Grayscale is it's not a great product because you can't subscribe, um, I think it's subscription is closed. So you have to buy it in the secondary market. So it doesn't actually track the Bitcoin price very well. And then when they open up for subscription, which I don't think they are uh, because of some SEC rulings, but if you, if you subscribe to the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, 
you can't redeem. So it's actually like the Hotel California. You can put your money in, but you can't take it out, which is not good. The only way to take it out is to sell it on the secondary market. And now that's at a 30% discount. So if I put in $1,000, I can only take it out. I can only take out 700 by selling it on the secondary market at a discount. So that's why there's a need for a more institutional product which trades or you can subscribe redeem at NAV at the net asset value. So that's that's what we do. We don't really see competition in the region. There's not many licensed products uh, that have solved for the tax, have solved for the uh, regulatory, the accounting, um, all of the, the kind of uh, things you would expect from an institutional grade fund. And who are your typical investors? Are there still HNIs and individuals who are coming to you or is there a trend from family offices and more sophisticated wealth managers who are looking at this asset, what's happening because you're right at the, you're offering services products for, 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 for this. Exchanges typically is more retail oriented, but um, yeah. is there an interest? Definitely. I mean, so you touched on all, all, I guess, the three key types. So there's, there's high net with individuals. There are people, I mean, our, the people that are going to invest in us, you know, they don't typically, the amount of money they're going to put, they don't feel just going onto the internet and putting on the you know, I'm going to put a half a million dollars or a million dollars, Adrian. I, I, I want to ring somebody if there's a problem. I want, to, I want to see that you exist, right? So oftentimes they don't feel that comfortable putting it on an exchange unless it's their full-time job. It's different, right? But, it's, you know, hey, it's my part of my portfolio. I have many things to do. Then So that's one. Family offices for sure. Again, it's not typically their full-time asset allocation, right? So they say, I don't I'm going to have a, a team of 10 people looking at this, right? So I just need a safe, secure way to get exposure family offices and then now we have i guess essentially the wealth managers and their their entities right so 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 they would they they have a nominee company or some asset management firm for their clients whether they invest through that any comments on the current bitcoin price um, any predictions uh, uh i i always get the predictions wrong but we're a long term i mean we we we, we have a weekly kind of newsletter uh where we give high level views. I think uh, at the moment, I think we're kind of in a, in a neutral position as in from a technical perspective. We look at technical charts, look at macro, we're kind of neutral. But we talk about long term, we are bullish. And, and we, Fintonia, haven't sold any Bitcoin. What we find is interesting, I guess, uh, Sunny, in, in the last six months is that because of the volatility, we have clients, like I said, that they give it to us and we dollar cost average and put in our yield fund and we move it out to a Bitcoin fund. But there are also people now that want kind of a structured solution, right? So, so we, we, we do things like you see in traditional finance, like accumulators, where you always be buying, if you always be buying it, at a, you know, if you get exercised, you, you buy at a 20% discount to the current share price. But if the share price stays within these limits, you get like a quite a high 20, 30% return. So if people have Bitcoin or they have USD, we, we kind of put these things. There are a lot of Chinese clients that are, that like this, they, they, they're happy to give up some upside. And what usually happens in traditional finance is because the volatility is quite low, then by the time you do all the structured product, the amount the, invest, the, amount the investor gets, the amount the manager gets, the amount the, the private bank takes a cut, then what's left for the investor is actually pretty crap. But because the volatility, um, and this is really for the major coins, right? We're talking Bitcoin and Ethereum. Because the volatility and liquidity is, is, is what it is, you can actually earn attractive returns. So if you already have Bitcoin or you have USD and you want to kind of limit your downside and cap some upside and say, I'm happy to get 90% and cap at 50% gain for three months, we can do that kind of thing. And then after they, uh, you get that, or, or you can basically earn like a 30% or 20% return on your Bitcoin, right? So, so these products, the other issue has happened, of course, is who's licensed? To do them so all the people that are doing them are unlicensed so now yeah. we actually have a lot of people coming to us saying hey would you you know your license you're going to run away can you uh structure this particularly the more sophisticated family offices uh, and even high net individuals that say you know what i i i just want to i have some bitcoin or i just want exposure and i'm happy to uh, give up some upside as long as i cap my downside right so you're also doing these options um for for people who have a decent enough ticket size then you can structure these products besides the funds that you have. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. Because we, we have a, uh, I mean, we have a, a, an investment and trading team, so um, they can manage that. And any Bitcoin events that you are planning to attend uh, this year? Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, 
there's uh, well, there's always Bitcoin Miami, but th this year I guess after did you attend that? Did you attend any of? You did okay, right? Yeah, yeah. we're well, in Singapore, right? It's just yeah. was much more difficult to travel uh, over the last couple of years, at least. Yeah. But so there is a not a Bitcoin specific event, but there's a very large crypto event in Hong Kong now, uh, and so so someone so, so, so my team has gone. Uh, I'm, I get a bit lazy to travel, but um. But yeah, there's a very, very big one now in Hong Kong. I think it's ten or ten thousand or fifteen thousand attendees. Uh, it's, it's by uh, uh, an affiliate. Uh, there's One Da, which is uh, a Chinese company, is an affiliated company. The One Da is a property company. They do cars and things like that. They used to be China's richest man. They, they, they're basically sponsoring this uh, uh, event in Hong Kong. Token 2049 will be held in Singapore this year, uh, and that had. Yeah, I don't know, 15,000 people. But that's not just Bitcoin. So you want to see wild, weird, strange. Yeah, it's, it's, it'll be token 2049. Yeah, this still exists, right? And with Bitcoin's price going up, you'll definitely find some other non-Bitcoin asset in the digital asset space, which will become the next hype. Any, any special offers for YPOs since we both are YPO members? Yes, uh, for YPOs, we'll always do uh, some, something special. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, if any YPOs have any questions about uh, Bitcoin or the crypto ecosystem, we'd be happy to help. So we, we've ended up being, in the last few years, becoming kind of experts uh, in bridging um, the crypto, uh, Bitcoin crypto ecosystem with traditional finance uh, and regulation. So it's almost like we're pretend lawyers, you know. Um, so it's not that easy to get your money in and out. It's not that easy to um, uh, be safe. And I think if any YPOs or any questions, we'll always be happy to uh, to help where we can. I've seen your journey starting this Bitcoin fund and it's uh, exciting when, you know, TradeFi or uh, FinTech people, entrepreneurs come into the Bitcoin space. So it's great. Before we wrap up, Adrian, how can people find you and how can people find Fintonia? Sure. Um, you can always contact us at uh, our website, which is fintoniagroup.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm on the YPO directory. Always happy to uh, hear from fellow YPOers. Are you on the YPO Bitcoin uh, Telegram group? Yes, I am on that Telegram group as well. Okay, great. So people can message DM you over there as well. Adrian, it's been a privilege. Uh, hopefully, 2023 is a better year for uh, Bitcoin after the last year. Thank you for coming uh, on 21 Towers. Thank you. Thanks, Sunny.